Good afternoon, family. Welcome to our special session, The Family, Consistent Across Faith Perspectives. My name is Richard DeSena, and I serve as the president of the Universal Peace Federation. It's a non-governmental organization with a special consultative study with the Economic and Social Council at the UN. And we work and stand very strong for the natural family at the UN. So we have a great panel here, great speakers. And as you can see, we will experience the significance of the family according to different faith traditions. And I like to talk very little, let them share their wisdom. And each one of them has 13 minutes. After that, we will have the opportunity for questions and answers. And hopefully, there will be a few minutes at the end so they can share their last thoughts to conclude. So let me begin first with our first speaker, Rabbi Avrimi Zippo. He was born in Toronto, Canada, and moved with his parents shortly thereafter to Salt Lake City, Utah, as they opened the local branch of the Shabbat movement the world's largest Jewish outreach movement. He was homeschooled through eighth grade due to the lack of Jewish schooling in Utah, after which he studied Talmudic academics in Chicago, Brooklyn, and abroad in the United Kingdom. He served for a year as an associate Talmudic expert in London as part of the Shabbat International Exchange Program and helped conduct Jewish outreach efforts in Denmark Italy, German, Sweden, Wales, and throughout the United States. He was ordained as an Orthodox rabbi by the former chief rabbi of Israel, Rabbi Israel Meir Lau, in December 2013. He married his wife, Sheina, in January 2014. And they were blessed with a son, Nini, in July 2014. Even, even at the long <laughs> That's great. And he currently serves as the Youth and Family Program Director of the Shabbat Lubavitch of Utah in Salt Lake City. Please join me in welcoming <laughs> Rabbi. <laughs> Rabbi in a beautiful opening prayer. At the Thank, beginning you. Of the time. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Richard. Um, good afternoon. It's an honor to be here. I wanted just to uh, provide, shed some light on how, uh, on my title, Richard so eloquently described it. I work for the Chabad Lubavitch movement, which as Richard said, is the world's largest Jewish outreach movement. I help direct its branch here in Salt Lake City, one of the, uh, I believe, the last count, 4,200 branches around the world. I got a somewhat more domestic posting. I'm happy here in Salt Lake City, as opposed to my colleagues who are literally in every far flung corner of the world. Um, I guess the, the objective of this session, I'd like to share with you a little bit about my experiences growing up as an observant Jew and how that impacted my family, how I grew up within my family, and how I now plan on um, applying that to the family which I will raise. Um, there's a story which I'd like to share, which, you know, some of the things I'm going to talk about today, I, I believe are very particular to Judaism and to the Jewish way of life, which I don't believe are very practical to everybody, whereas some messages that I'd like to share, I believe have a very universal and global message. Being a observant rabbi in Utah, I find myself somewhat often doing these sorts of sessions or talks or you know discussions, sharing with the wider community what it means to be a Jew in Salt Lake City. And a short while ago, I gave a talk to a group of junior high school students. They came to the synagogue, they were doing a world religions class, and they came to the synagogue to kind of hear what it is to be a Jew, which most of None of the students in the class were Jewish, and they wanted to hear an authentic Jewish perspective on Judaism. And after I gave my little spiel, as I'm going to do now, we opened it up for questions, which usually, you know, questions from that demographic, when they come to see a religion which they've never known about before, tend to get very uh, far-reaching. It gets very exciting. And so one of the first questions I almost always get is about my head covering. I'm not talking about the, the stylish black hat, that's more customary. I'm talking about the kippah, which you'll see mo a lot of observant Jewish men will wear some sort of head covering, some call it a kippah, others call it a yarmulke, it's got a variety of different names. And so one of the young men in the group asked me, what's up with the head covering? And so I told him, I told the rest of the group, and I'll share with you that in, in Jewish culture there's a popular uh, saying 
that a Jew never answers a question directly. We're not very good at giving straight answers. Every question is answered with a question. And so I told him that I'd be happy to provide him an answer by asking him a question, and I asked if the entire group in the room would, would participate in an exercise with me. And they all said, yeah, sure. So I asked the young man, I said, nice little question. He was 13 years old. I said, would you ever commit murder? He looks at me shocked. I ever commit murder? God forbid, murder? No. I, thank God, I'm happy to hear that. I thought as much. Why not? So you see the, 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 the looks on the faces around the room. Why not? Good question. And so you hear different snippets coming from different corners of the room. Well, it's not humane. Well, it's wrong. It's illegal. You hear, you know, different thoughts, different messages being shared. All valid, all correct. I said, okay, good. So let me ask you a question, young man. I said, do you have a little sibling? Do you have a younger sibling, a little brother, a little sister? Yeah, both actually, both a little brother and a little sister. I said, fantastic. I said, I don't want you to, God forbid, imagine this about your family, because I would never wish this on anybody, but I want you to imagine a hypothetical situation for a second, that you were to walk into a room, come home from school one day, and you walk into your house, and you walk into your living room, and God forbid your little sister, brother, whoever it is, a, a loved one of yours is lying on the floor, lying in a pool of blood. They've been attacked. And standing over your little sister's body is an attacker holding a weapon of some sort. And God knows what he's just done to your beloved little sister. And you walk into the room, and you subdue the attacker, and you overpower him, and now you are holding his weapon. And he is at your mercy. Would you kill him? And you see the looks on the faces around the room. You see the certainty is rattled a little bit. All the people who a minute before had told me that in no way, shape, or form would they ever commit murder, suddenly their resolve was a little bit questioned. And you hear the hemming and hawing, eh, I don't think so. It would probably be better to call the police. It would probably be better to let them handle things. But you could see the certainty that we had experienced just a short minute ago ceased to exist. Some of them would entertain the thought that if something would have done, somebody, God forbid, would have done something drastic to their beloved little sister, and they were then at their mercy and no one were to know about it, they might do away with the person. And so I said to the young men and women in the room, I said, regardless of what somebody does to your little sister or your little brother or anybody in the world, murder is still wrong. And therefore, in my opinion, the reason why we don't commit murder not, not just as Jews, as a humanity, that anybody shouldn't commit murder, is not for any of the reasons that were listed before, because it's illegal, because it's this, because it's that. I believe there's one reason why we don't commit murder. That is because murder is something which is not godly. And each and every one of us has a responsibility, Jewish, not Jewish, whatever, whatever, however we choose to define ourselves, each one of us has a responsibility to lead a godly life. And leading a godly life means that if I find myself in a situation where I have every good excuse and every good reason to do something which I might have never done, but in this situation I believe it might be permissible for myself, above all I lead a godly life, and therefore I would never ever do something of that act. And I explained to the people sitting in the room that that is the reason why I cover my head. Why as an observant Jew I constantly have a head covering is to constantly remind myself of the responsibility to lead a godly life. That though things might go on in my life, though I may experience things that may not work out for me, that I may question why they happen, why do bad things happen to good people, and the whole list of things, I remember that at all times, as an observant Jew, I'm proud to carry a responsibility to lead a godly life. And that was the message that I shared with the young people in the room. They took it, and, and they, they went home with it, whatever that means. As an observant Jew, growing up in a family environment, that is, I believe, the predominant message that I grew up with and that I believe every Jew grows up with and that I, share, I choose to share with my family now as we start our own family is we as, as observant Jews, we believe that everybody in the world has this responsibility to an extent, but we as observant Jews have a responsibility to lead a godly life. There's a fascinating teaching of Jewish thought as it pertains to the Ten Commandments. I'm sure you've all heard of the Ten Commandments seen the Ten Commandments in some form, whether it's uh, Michelangelo or in some uh, modern culture in a movie, in some depiction of Moses coming down with the whole long white hair, you know, the way Moses was, was meant to look, holding the two tablets, containing the Ten Commandments. And there's a fascinating piece of Jewish thought that's pertaining to the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were written on two different stone tablets, and there were five on one side and five on another side. What are the Ten Commandments? You start with, I am the Lord your God, believe in God not to have any gods before me, not to take God's name in vain, to observe the Sabbath, 
honor thy father and mother. Then you have all the no-nos. Don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't bear false witness, and don't covet. There's an interesting thought shared that the two tablets, each one with their set of five commandments, represent two different levels of relationships that we as human beings have. There's a relationship that we have with God, and there's, there's relationships that we have with our fellow men and women, with our fellow members of humanity. And so the first five commandments pertain to our relationship with God, whereas the last five commandments, they're speaking more specifically about our relationship with humanity. Well, it's a nice thought, but if you think about it for a second, there's a flaw with that reason, and that is, what is the fifth of the Ten Commandments, what is the last one that finds itself on, quote unquote, on God's tablet, is honor thy father and mother. Now, I personally believe that my father and mother are God. But in case there was anyone in the room who didn't believe their father and mother were God, how could we say that the, the obligation that we have to honor our father and mother are on the godly side of the tablets? Shouldn't it be more on the interhuman relationship side of the tablets together with not stealing and not killing, etc., etc.? And the message the answer to the question, which contains within it a very deep message, is that in and of itself that God placed the fifth commandment of honor thy father and mother together with all the other godly commandments because God was trying to teach us a very, very powerful lesson. That our family and our parents, we must remember at all times, are a divine gift. And there may be times that we think, well, my father is a good for nothing and my mother doesn't know how to raise me and you know my parents made this mistake with me and my parents are flawed in this way. At all times, it is incumbent upon us to remember that our family that we have, exactly the way we have it, with our siblings, with our crazy uncle, with our grandparents that have this problem, with all of the details involved within it, our family is a divine gift. And that pertains to the family that we grow up in, that we have as a gift, and that pertains to the family that, they, that we then subsequently raise when we start our own families. We need to remember that the children, our spouses, the families that we begin to create on our own are a divine gift, and they are God's special, special present to us that we must be very careful, and we must pay a lot of attention to how we handle that extra special divine gift. So I want us to discuss a few interesting practical notes pertaining to leading a godly life within the family atmosphere. One area that I, I find people find very curious, and I actually find it to be extremely practical, as it happened when I walked in the room before, I'd like to speak about um, relationships between men and women within the observant Jewish faith. I, as Richard mentioned, I was homeschooled through the age of 13, and then I went off to high school out of state, as there is no Jewish high school in Utah. And as I was homeschooled, the only girls in my school were my sisters. And once I left home to go to high school, I was in an all-boys school all the way through, all the way through my ordination, an all-boys high school, an all-boys rabbinical college, and the last few years that I spent preparing for my ordination were in an all-boys facility. The first young lady in the entire world that I ever had any sort of relationship with on any level was my wife. As interesting as that sounds in today's society. Very often when I have, when I discuss this topic, I'll get a question, which I hope I don't steal any of your questions you're about to ask. People sometimes will be a little bit embarrassed and a little bit timid, and they'll say, Rabbi, did you have an arranged marriage? And the answer is absolutely. And people recoil a little bit, really, an arranged marriage? Yeah, how did it work? Yeah, it worked, it was very simple. Right? What do you mean? I say, the Chabad movement is based in Brooklyn, and in our headquarters, in the middle of Brooklyn, in the midst of all the taxis and all the noise, there's an office, and in the office sits an elderly rabbi with long white hair and a long white beard and long flowing white robes, and he sits in this big office, and he has in front of him two big computer screens. One is pink and one is blue. <laughs> and every, morning, every morning he wakes up and he experiences divine inspiration. And he looks at the green at the pink screen, I'm sorry, and he sees a number over there, you know, two, four, six, nine, seven. And he looks at the blue screen and he sees oh, another number, three, five, eight, one, two, and he matches them up. And at that moment, I get an email in my inbox saying, Dear Rabbi Zippel, congratulations, you're engaged. Your wedding will take place in six weeks at this or this place and this and this time. Be there on time. At this point, usually everyone's like, no. <laughs> and so, yes, I will be honest. No, that is not the way it is. <laughs> what does it mean? What does it mean that I had an arranged marriage? Well, an arranged marriage in our circles, I believe that an arranged marriage gets a bit of a bad rap. I believe. I think the fairest uh, description of how my wife and I met would be a blind date, which 
you know, in today's society, a blind date, you know, the term blind date is very cool, you know, that's very PC. Arranged marriage sounds very yeah. scary, very medieval. I was studying in a rabbinical college, and uh, I had a teacher, a nice guy, a, a professor of mine. I interacted with him a few times. You know, we studied together, and this professor of mine had a little sister. And after I completed my year in the college, unbeknownst to me, my professor made a phone call to his mother, and he says, you know, I understand that my dear little sister, Shayna, is, you know, approaching the age of marriage, and if I may, I'd like to suggest a, a match for my sister. It's this young man who studied in rabbinical college, and as happens in our circles, um, my future mother-in-law uh, reached out to somebody who, by profession, is a is a matchmaker, or kind of a go-between between one side and the other, and they approached, they reached out to my mother, and they said, you know, is your son approaching the age of marriage? Are you ready to hear marriage proposals? Yes, we are. And uh, information was exchanged, and my mother and my, and my wife's mother decided that everything seemed okay, and my wife and I were introduced. We were introduced, we went on a date, like most other young couples would go on a date. I had to know our first date was in the Waldorf Astoria in Manhattan. It was not in some, you know, synagogue. We didn't meet by the bookcase. We met in a nice hotel lobby, and we dated, and we were both absolutely given the, uh, the uh, permission, if you would say, the option at any time to dump it. You to say goodbye or to continue dating and we dated and we decided I proposed in the middle of Times Square it's a very romantic story it is not an arranged marriage and and we got married so you know a lot of times there's that misconception that you know in very very observant circles you know a guy and a girl aren't introduced they the foggiest idea what they look like before they get married just like to dispel that notion for a little bit so you know yes I believe you could say it's fair we had quote unquote an arranged marriage but I believe it's more accurate to say and my wife and I were set up on a blind date. <laughs> after I got married, and this is where I believe things are more practical, after I got married in the observant Jewish faith, out of respect to my wife, and my wife out of her respect to myself, I will not exchange any physical contact with any other female in the entire world, aside for my immediate family, my mother, my sister, my grandmother, my aunt. So when I walked in, and I don't want you to feel bad, this happens literally four times a day. I walked in, Lynn you know, extended her hand, and as the line that I've developed, mm -hmm. you, know, you kind of grow used to using it. Yes, as you heard, I offer my heart, not my hand. For a man, I will, I will shake hands. For a woman, I will extend my heart. That is not because I disrespect a woman and I don't respect her enough to shake her hand. It is out of the large amount of respect that I have for my wife, which is you know, the person I respect the most in the entire world. I do not exchange physical contact with any other female, any other lady in the world, not because I don't respect them, in fact I respect them tremendously, which is why I greet them, I don't believe shaking hands is the only way to greet and to acknowledge and to show respect for any other person in the world, I absolutely respect them and I acknowledge them and I thank them for whatever they provide to society, but I will not exchange physical contact with any other woman in the entire world, and the same goes for my wife, my wife will not exchange physical contact with any other man aside for her father or her brothers, thank you, and, uh, and, um, um, I guess, you know, aside from making exceptions, my wife has to go see a doctor, you know, you're not going to drive yourself crazy to find a female doctor, but I find that something very interesting, which people a lot of times would like to know, and people get very embarrassed when they extend their hand and it becomes a whole awkward situation, I find it important for people to know. One thing I'd like to conclude with, as Richard is slipping me notes under the table, no, 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 I, I, I appreciate the, the I appreciate the timekeepers, there's no clock on the back wall. Um, one thing I find it very important to share, speaking about you know the family unit, which is consistent across all faiths. Is, as Richard mentioned, I, I had a, a brief interview with the Desert News before the uh, Congress started. And the reporter asked me you know, how I feel about participating in the World Congress of Families, and I said the entire concept of family means so much more to me that in July my wife and I were blessed with our first child, and you know, to be a father really is, uh, is, is an incredible experience, for, especially for the first time. And one thing that's really changed in my life as I've uh, entered parenthood, which I'd like to share with you today, is I think we all believe in a certain sense, as adults, as members of society, that we all know the difference between right and wrong. We like to believe that we're all adults, we're all grown-ups, we all believe the difference between right and wrong. We live in a somewhat crazy world, and sometimes I wonder, you know, my innocent little boy, right now he's three months old, he doesn't know a whole lot, but we live in a world which society has provided us with so much information, some good and some bad, which is constantly being bombarded in our faces. And I sometimes wonder what it's going to be like, you know, my child, my boy is going to grow up in you know, four, five, six, seven, ten, fifteen years. 
I wonder what the world is going to present to him when he grows up. And one thing I've noticed that, interesting as it is, as society has gone along, we live in a time nowadays where I believe it's fair to say it has never been harder to stick to your values, to stick to your guns, if those are values and beliefs that popular society, that you know, the general world culture doesn't agree with. You know, in today's day and age, either you go with the flow, or you're an extremist, or you're a hater, or you're a bigot. Your values are not worth anything if they are not in line with the mainstream society. And I think the responsibility that each and every one of us has a family, as a member of a family, as a leader of a family, regardless of our faith, regardless of anything else that may define us, is we have a responsibility to provide for our children and to provide for the entire world a feeling of safety and comfort that our children will grow up knowing that come what may, they never need to feel ashamed, they never need to feel embarrassed, they never need to feel alone to do what they think is right. Facebook might tell them opposite, Twitter might tell them the opposite, today we're blessed with a 24-hour news cycle, we're blessed with social media, we're blessed with an abundance of people telling our people, telling our children, telling our young people what is right and what is wrong. And I think our responsibility as a family reaching across all faiths is to provide a culture for our children and for our loved ones where they can know that they never need to feel ashamed or scared or embarrassed or anything of the sort to do and to believe what is right and what is strong for them. And that, I believe, is the incredible gift and responsibility that each and every one of us has as a family. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rabbi Zippo. And I understand the, he needs to go. To oh, sure, please. Our, our, Sabbath. Sab our, Sabbath, our Sabbath begins at sundown, so as oh. we're approaching so standard time, sundown is... Uh, have any questions for the rabbi before he... Hopefully write them on your cards. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, Wendy, yeah. can you raise your hand? So if you have any questions, you can write them down, give it to Wendy, and then we can... Okay, I was just going to have a comment, um, and just my comment was that I mean, your your presence has been really felt at the conference, and and I just wanted to tell you how much I appreciated your invocation Thank you. to the conference. Thank um, you very much. I was uh, me and, and a whole row of my friends. We were literally just in tears, and we just felt like that. Um, that that was the, the perfect start to the conference, and Thank so you. I just wanted to express my gratitude for your presence here, and, and I think it's been felt in a really great way. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. It's been an honor to participate, and I, I think that conferences like these where, you know, we, we stand up for what we believe in, I guess, as I said, and though, though society may feel otherwise about it, I think it's important. And I, obviously in a respectful way, in a tolerant way, in a way that promotes diversity and acceptance of everybody in the world's opinion, they're all equally entitled to their opinion, as we are to ours. But I believe that at a, at a conference where we promote things that are right, things that we know to be right, and things that we believe to be right in a respectful, tolerant way, we cannot think of anything greater in this world. Thank you. Oh, okay. So you in the cars? Or? I was just going to make a comment. Oh, just no, say, to right. say that you're not alone in having an arranged marriage. Oh, I oh, also oh. had <laughs> one. <laughs> but probably much more arranged than yours was, because I met my husband the night before we got married. Oh, so, so, so I, you're I, I you're three, months, three months advance notice. Um, so, should I read it out loud? Or? Sure. So, I got quite interesting. Do the Chabad participate in the Boy Scouts of America? Why or why not? Um, interesting question. I, I know that there are some rabbis who, who actually on the uh, adult end of things participate in, in the Boy Scouts of America. I, I definitely don't believe there's any uh, ideological for or against if Chabad should participate in the Boy or Boy Scouts of America. If I personally didn't, not because I had a, an opinion about it or not because I, uh, there was anything I was opposed to, I do know that there are um, branches of Chabad that engage their youth in Boy Scouts of America. There are rabbis who do participate in Boy Scouts, and it, I, I, I would assume that the principles and the, the ideology which you know the Boy Scouts are, are based on are things which are very aligned with the Chabad movement. Is there time for one more question? Yeah, I love it. Yes. We worry about oh. your time. Well, and, and our time too. But. Anyway, sure. one more yeah. question. We're a family, so <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> family. And uh, excuse me, uh, I don't speak English very much, but I am very happy to 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 have uh, to have some 
some some uh, same uh, full uh, in uh, inter intersection, called intersection, commonality. Similar. Uh, uh, especially uh, when uh, you you tell, uh, tell us that uh, you you want uh, you want to take a hand with the woman because uh, your wife is very. Uh, this is woman for you. Yes. Uh, we had this. Uh, we have uh, the same uh, that in, uh, in our religion. Glad to hear. I think I think it's something which is very much misunderstood. People, a lot of people will think, you know, especially with observant Jews, with general, there's a stigma of our very anti-female, you know, rhetoric. Oh, you won't shake my hand. Is it because there's something wrong with me? There's absolutely nothing wrong with you. I think the reason why I wouldn't shake a lady's hand is not because of, God forbid, any lack of respect that I have for the female race. It's because of the tremendous amount of respect that I have for my wife, which I would hope that you would respect, because I, I hope your husband should have the same amount of respect for you. And every man should respect women that much. That is why I will not shake the hand of any other woman, and I hope that I can convey that respect to them in another way which is not associated with that. So this is a very good beginning, and you ended very well, too. Thank you. <laughs> this is our last session. Fantastic. I'm glad that we were able to provide that. I invited a rabbi, so I really wanted to personally thank you. It's a pleasure. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Let's big rabbi one. to listen to Rabbi, I'm glad I was going to say, everybody stand up, hug each other, say I love you, because we're a family, but then we didn't do that. Right? Yeah, that's a big challenge here. So, thank you. Um, so this is great to receive from different faith perspective the significance of the family. Our next speaker is Jana Scott. She's a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. And she has served in a variety of capacities in her faith, among them president of the children's organization. She has been a teacher, organized summer camp for young women, and served in presidencies in the women's and young women's organizations for her congregation. Diana has also served in a variety of music callings, including choir director and congregation organist. We should bring one. She currently works with the youth, helping them discover their family history. Jana uh, has worked professionally in the government, nonprofit, and business sectors. Her degrees are in international relations, and her work experience includes consultant and civic engagement to UNICEF headquarters and international cultural relations for the state of Utah. Jana has also been very active with the Salt Lake Interfaith Round Table. Let's welcome Jana Scott. Thank you. It's so nice to be here. And it has been so much fun to have all of you in Salt Lake City. It's on the going? Okay, we'll see if everything else pops up. Thanks. Thanks for all the help from the audience. And the happens. Um, it's been really delightful to have all of you in town. We left this last week. We welcome you. Hope you've had a wonderful time. Some of you I know are locals because I see some familiar faces. But anyway, we hope you've had a wonderful time here. Um, it looks like, oh, it's going. Great. I thought we were going to move out. God is working in the <laughs> Blessed in many ways. Um, I just like to start by talking about one of the things I love most, which is light. I love the light that you find in the morning when you first wake up and you go outside, go on a walk. The brightness and, and just the... The beautiful way that that gets you off to, to a start on your day. Uh, I love how light makes things more beautiful. Here's a so here's the first picture. Here's a picture of Bryce Canyon when it's a little bit dark. When there's a little bit more light, you can see things much more clearly. And look what happens when the sun is brilliantly shining off it at sunset time. I love how light makes things more beautiful and brings out the natural beauty in things, both in in natural things and also in people. Um, as a photographer, I love those evening times when the light just sparkles in people's faces and catches the light in their eyes. Um, another aspect of light, this first example here is just a picture of a blanket. See how where it's dark, it's very hard to see the detail, but where there's light you can see great detail in the texture of that material. In the second you can see um, a table, again where there's not light you can't see very much of what's there, where there's light you can see the details of the wood and the, 
the pieces there. In the final one, light also brings out the dust in my house that, that I can't see when it's not so, not so bright. So um, anyway, I think there are a lot of ways that, that light is similar in our own lives. You know, light helps us see the way before us clearly. It helps us understand and see things around us more clearly. And it certainly brings out the beauty both in, in ourselves, in our lives, and in um, just the meaning of life and the things around us. And from that note, so I wanted to show you, I was thinking of how could I share with you uh, my faith and, and what it teaches about families. And I felt like the best thing I could do would be just to show you the end result, show you families um, and the results of living those teachings in their lives. So I have this wonderful slideshow, but everything just completely disappeared of the last minute. So I will describe for you to my best ability, and you can just imagine with me. Um, there, there are pictures from, from a, we have a magazine that captures our semi-annual conference uh, where we gather together with, with members of the church from across the world um, by, by broadcast and so forth. Anyway, there's a, there are pictures of fathers and sons together um, with, with bright looks in their faces and loving expressions. There are pictures of mothers um, carefully teaching their child to walk or cradling uh, a child in, in her arms. And I love because I love some of these photos because in the background you also see the father who has a bright smile on his face as he sees his wife light up as she makes their little boy laugh. Um, there are pictures of families in many different countries and of many different colors. Um, a family, I think from the Philippines, with a mother and father on their little motorcycle and the two children smashed in between <laughs> um, on their way to church. Um, there are photos of Latin American families in the rain and, and three or four, I think some had five children. And, and there's just a sense of joy in their faces and there's a sense of light in their eyes. And um, for me that's, that's the essence and the heart of, of our teachings about the family. So let me tell you just a little bit about um, let me share with you our, some teachings about family and then some tools we have and that we use to help strengthen our families. There's a statement called a proclamation to the world about the family that comes from our church leaders. And let me just read you a, a small part of that. I think we actually all had copies of this in our, our bags when we came, so you'll recognize and be familiar with that. I'm just going to read a couple of small parts of it. Uh, it says, We, the First Presidency and the Council of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, solemnly proclaim that marriage between a man and a woman is ordained of God, and that the family is central to the Creator's plan for the eternal destiny of His children. All human beings, male and female, are created in the image of God. Each is a beloved spirit, son, or daughter of heavenly parents, and as such, each has a divine nature and destiny. Gender is an essential characteristic of individual premortal, mortal, and eternal identity and purpose. We believe that before we were born and came to earth that we were with God, that we then had the opportunity to come to earth um, to have those experiences that would allow us to grow and progress and develop. That each of us has incredible um, divine and, and eternal potential. And, and you feel the products of, of growing in your life every day. We feel that life is about the opportunity to grow and to more fully develop all that we are intended to become and all that we have the opportunity to become. And as part of that, we, um, let me again read from the proclamation. It says, the divine plan of happiness enables family relationships to be perpetuated beyond the grave. Sacred ordinances and covenants available in holy temples much like the temple you saw if you went to the tabernacle last night, the temple with the bright lit up building next to it, make it possible for individuals to return to the presence of God and for families to be united eternally. Um, when I think of how much I love my husband, my parents, my family, I'm grateful that that isn't just about this life, but that it's an eternal thing that will last beyond. Um, so let me just share with you a few tools, things that we use to help strengthen our families. One is um, family home evening. We have a special day, Monday during the week, we set aside for our families and spend that time doing fun things together, um, teaching uh, principles and things that will help us to grow spiritually. And um, as you can imagine, those are sometimes challenging with little children and, and all the different dynamics that come into gathering a family. But those are also some treasured memories and things that help us 
set aside one day a week that is always, you know, one evening that's always for our families. That's in addition to the church on Sundays. Um, let me read another small part from the proclamation that I think also captures um, some of the great tools for building strong families. It says, successful marriages and families are established and maintained on principles of faith, prayer, repentance, forgiveness, respect, love, compassion, work, and wholesome recreational activities. My husband and I love the outdoors, and we love to hike and camp and things like that. So things like that build our relationship in wonderful ways. Um, with my siblings, we love to bike. So anytime we go on a family vacation, we all strap our bikes to our cars and, and get outside and go on a nice bike ride. Those wonderful fun times are an important part of things, just as are the spiritual things of faith and of praying together and, and so forth. Um, so let me just jump again to some of those tools that help us build strong families. Another is that of family prayer. We pray regularly together as families. Um, certainly in, in the mornings, as we send our children off to school and start our days and everyone goes their different directions, and when we come back together at night before we go to bed. Um, that might vary from family to family, but family prayer is a strong tradition that we um, that helps draw us close. Uh, another is studying the scriptures together. We learn the word of God together, and that helps us as we're learning and growing at our different stages and ages in our families to... Um, to find the principles and things that will help us to be happy and, and to grow in ways that will more fully develop our, our potential. Um, so as brothers and sisters, we have a great opportunity to help each other in understanding the Word of God. It points the direction. It brings some of that clarity that the light brings in terms of helping us understand and see how to do that. Um, how am I doing on time? Am I okay still? Oh, you're okay. Maybe I shouldn't ask. I'll Eight I'll minutes. Write a letter. <laughs> you have five more minutes. So one that I work quite a bit with lately, which has been a lot of fun, family history is really important to us in our faith. And so we spend time learning about our ancestors and those who came before us and have wonderful charts where you can track, um, you can track those relationships and connections. Um, some would call it a family tree. We have other ways of looking at it too. It's one, um, a variety of different ways you can look at it. But I work with, a lot with the youth at church and we've done a lot to start to research and find stories about our ancestors. And it's just been wonderful to see what happens as young people learn about people who came before them. Um, on a particular day last year, we were celebrating my grandparents, who had both passed away. And so my mother, in order to share a little bit about my grandparents with her grandchildren, um, who had never met you know, um, her parents or, or my father's parents, she made a suitcase and, and filled it with things that were from my grandma and grandpa. So an old pilot's hat and, you know, pretty things from my grandmother. And they would open the suitcase and pull those out and with each, each thing that was pulled out there would be a story about something that grandpa did when he was a pilot or something that grandma did. And the children loved it and just thought it was wonderful. Um, it's a simple thing. But that connection between generations, I think, is significant. Um, as, as young people face challenges today, I think they find great strength from hearing what their great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents did. You know, those who sailed across seas to, to go to a new land, or those who faced great challenges in their own lands. Um, hearing those stories gives us a connection to those people, and also gives us the courage and strength that we can do hard things in our time and in our lives. So family history, I think, is a significant way of, of binding our families together. And since we believe that the family can be eternal and last beyond, um, beyond the grave, beyond death, that we'll, we continue to be together, um, those bonds are all the more significant to develop now, so that families will be tied together. Um, another, so those are some of the tools let me just offer a couple other perspectives that I think are, are interesting and helpful. We sometimes think of family as, um, as our, a little bit of a workshop, or it's a place to grow, a place to learn. It's a safe place for us to have those growing experiences that stretch us and that help us become better, that help us develop the virtues and some of the attributes that Rabbi Zippel was talking about. my own siblings and my own family and the part they play in that. I'm especially grateful for my husband. Um, well, I can do 
<laughs> there are certain things in our growth that that only come from that wonderful divine relationship between a husband and wife. There are many wonderful opportunities I've had in life and, and so many fun things I was able to do before and, and, and attributes that I was able to develop. But there were so many of the most beautiful things that never were fully opened until he came and until we made those covenants um, of marriage in the temple that you you saw probably just last night. <coughs> I'm grateful for that wonderful blessing, and I believe that that's an important part of God's design in creating marriage as a man. Um, there's nothing that brings greater joy or more fulfillment or more completion to our lives than that sacred relationship. We also believe that as we make those covenants of marriage with each, with each other, that it's also a covenant with God. And as a result of that, we have that extra blessing on our marriage. So it makes it even more than just, even better than just the two of us. When we're giving our best, sometimes, sometimes I still need a little extra help to, to, to soften my heart about something or to improve in some way. And I find that with that blessing of having um, the blessings of God in our marriage, that it's able to elevate us and to help us be better and to bring peace and sweetness and tenderness and joy. And I'm grateful for that wonderful blessing. Um, I sense that my time is up. <laughs> so perhaps I can just finish with um, with a picture from my wedding day. Um, I've loved this one because it, it's a reminder that everywhere we go and everything we do is arm in arm, hand in hand, side by side. That it's, it's together. As we make those covenants of marriage and are blessed uh, with the blessings of God, that we, we go through everything and do everything together. And that creates more wondrous opportunities um, and the most fulfilling and joyful things I've experienced in my life. And uh, I think with that, add one little housekeeping note. Sure. Um, you're welcome to stand up and take pictures, but if you can make sure that this camera it okay. stays clear and um, kind of be aware of it if, you. if you're getting up, coming in or leaving. Let's thank one more time Rabbi Ezekiel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jennifer Robert Morse. Dr. Morse is the founder of the Ruth Institute, an interfaith organization that heals the victims and survivors of the sexual revolution. She has authored or co-authored four books and spoken around the globe on marriage, family, and human sexuality. The work has been translated into Spanish, Korean, <laughs> Chinese, I don't know how to say that, Mandarin, Korean, Polish. Her newest book is The Sexual Revolution and Its Victims. She earned her PhD at the University of Rochester and taught economics at Yale and George Mason University. Dr. Morris was named one of the Catholic stars of 2013 on a list. Yes, you can clap. <laughs> <laughs> <A list. laughs> Good. Pope Francis. I'm from the same country, Paul Francis, and Paul Benedict XVI. Dr. Morse and her husband are parents of an adopted child, a birth child, a goddaughter, and were foster parents for the San Diego County to eight foster children. Please join me in welcoming. Well, thanks for inviting me to be on this panel. Um, this is a very interesting topic to me that's close to my heart. I took as my charge, I, I was kind of a late addition to the panel, and I take as my charge to explain, um, not so much um, in a personal way, um, the, the Catholic approach to, to marriage and family, but to give some of you an idea of Catholic theology 
about this matter. Um, because, and, I, and I've noticed in a lot of these kind of pro-marriage interfaith gatherings, people are always asking each other questions about their respective faiths, and I think it's very important. Um, you know, we had a conversation like this last, just last night on our way to the Mormon Tabernacle <laughs> Choir concert. We, you know, we were all mixing it up and trying to understand each other's position. So I, that's, that's what I'm going to do for the next 12 minutes, is just tell you a little bit about Catholic theology and, um, and, and family. And I think it's fair to say that the Catholic view of marriage um, mirrors the Catholic view of the cosmos. Uh, and that's not an exaggeration to say that. It might sound over the top. But in point of fact, St. Paul says this very clear. So any of you who read the New Testament, who read the, you know, the, the Christian scripture, St. Paul's very clear in Ephesians um, that when he's talking about proper family life, that the proper family life between husband and wife in some way mirrors the life of Christ and the church. And so as Catholics, we take that passage very seriously and, um, and, and recognize that we're all in some way called to have a spousal relationship with Jesus Christ because that's the, the church, you know, Christ and the church is not just girls in the church, even though Jesus is a guy. You know, it sounds a little weird for a guy to be having a spousal relationship with Jesus, and sometimes guys are a little freaked out about it, but, um, but, that's, but that's what Paul is saying. You know, he's saying on some level that's, you know, that the, the cosmos and Christ and God have this kind of spousal covenantal relationship. Um, and, and then the, the other scripture that's very important to us is in Matthew 19, and the corresponding passage in Mark 10, where we talk about where Jesus talks to us about the indissolubility of marriage, or that's the way that's how we process that whole dialogue between Jesus and the Pharisees. Um, is it proper for any cause for a man to divorce his wife? And Jesus tells them uh, he he answers that by referring back to the beginning. He says, "In the beginning, it was not so." And then he quotes from Genesis. And I'm sorry, the rabbi had to leave, um, but he quotes from Genesis and says. Uh, um, uh, a man shall, for this cause, a man shall uh, leave his mother and father and cling to their wife, and and uh, and, the, and the two shall become one flesh. And he's basically telling them uh, that it was for the hardness of your hearts that Moses allowed you to write a, a bill of divorce. And and the apostles are completely freaked out when he says this. The scripture is very clear. The, the apostles are like, "What? You know, this is like way too hard. We can't do this. Or what are you talking about? You know." Um, and, and so he then goes on uh, to talk about, yeah, well, you think that's tough. Let me tell you the next thing. The next thing is uh, lifelong celibacy is a possibility for some people, too. And so the church has always interpreted this batch of these, this combination of passages. Uh, we like to try to read them all together. We don't like to take just one. You know, we like to say, how do they work together? And we've always taken this group of passages to mean that there are two different ways that we, that we on earth mirror our future life in heaven. And one is through the spousal love between a husband and wife, that that relationship that we have, that I have with my husband, is a, is a foretaste of my ultimate relationship with Jesus Christ and the Holy Trinity uh, for all eternity. So it's a foretaste of it. Um, and, and at the same time, the, the relationship that a celibate priest or a celibate sister or a celibate brother, that an avowed celibate person would have uh, that that person is having a relationship with Jesus Christ that is not physical in any way, but which is in a sense which is spiritual and which is also in its way a foretaste of that divine relationship that we're all going to have. And so, in the in the Catholic tradition, we look at one another and kind of say, well, you know, if married couples are living out their vocation well, it's easier for the priests to live out their vocation to celibacy well, and vice versa. If the priests fall down on the job, it's difficult for the, it makes it more difficult for the married couples to, 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 to live out their vocations. And so the way I like to talk about it is that when I, as a married woman, have a, you know, I have a, this relationship with my husband, it's wonderful, and it's, it's powerful, it's passionate, and, uh, and it's everything Jesus wants us to be, and someday he's going to do that with me and with him, and it's going to be great and everything. Um, but my husband is not God. I'm quite certain of this. Mm -hmm. right? and, and, and he's getting old, and he's getting bald, and he's got a little punch, and he's going to die, you know. Um, whereas a woman who, bec and, and I, sometimes I say this jokingly, you know, if you want a perfect guy, ladies, you need to become a nun. Okay, you become a nun, you're married to Jesus. He's a perfect guy, but you're never going to touch him in this life, right? But he won't go bald or get grumpy with you, you know, so it's kind of a, a trade-off, you know, and that, that's the way the Catholic um, tradition puts those pieces together. So the indissolubility of marriage is a very important point in Catholic theology and Catholic practice, 
And it's, I think, something that makes Catholicism unique in the modern world. And I don't know if you've been following all the controversy over the Synod of Bishops in Rome, where they've been talking about this question of whether divorced and civilly remarried persons can receive Holy Communion. The reason this is such an important question in Catholic theology um, is that if you are divorced, you cannot remarry, okay? We don't care what the government says. You have a civil remarriage. You are not married to that person. You are still married to the first guy. Okay, you know, you're still, that marriage is still valid. And, and Pope Francis even reaffirmed the ancient teaching when he said, if there's a marriage, it's indissoluble. If it's a nullity, that is, if there never was a marriage in the first place, then it's nothing. You know, it doesn't matter. Then it's nothing. And, and, uh, and so he affirmed that ancient teaching when he, when he said that in his, you know, his somewhat joking, um, you know, his unique way, let us just say, Pope well, Francis has his own unique way of saying things. But the reason this, <coughs> this question is so important <coughs> is that if you are divorced and you, uh, get a, and you get remarried and you're living with another man, um, you are committing adultery with that man. And we don't care what the government says about it. That's an adulterous relationship. Adultery is considered a mortal sin. Therefore, you do not present yourself to, for communion in a state of mortal sin. And that's what all the what all the controversy is about. And that's why people, <coughs> that's why what the bishops decide over there has significance for so many different parts of Catholicism. It's not just about how you're going to treat marriage. It's also what do you think about the sacraments? Um, what do you think about sin? You know, all of those things are implicated in how that question gets resolved. And so. Um, the way Catholics handle it, and a lot of times people think this is um, splitting hairs or something, <coughs> something Jesuitical. I don't know, that's a good old 18th century adjective, Jesuitical. <laughs> it means that you're splitting hairs and it's not a, it's not a compliment um, to say that you're Jesuitical. But, um, but if, you, uh, if, if you are Catholic and you have a divorce, the only way you can get remarried is if you receive a decree of nullity from a proper ecclesial authority. And what is a decree of nullity? It mean, it doesn't mean a Catholic divorce. What it means is that there never was, it's a finding of fact that there never was really a marriage there in the first place, that the marriage was not valid, that there, you attempted a marriage, but it wasn't really a marriage. And so it, it, for a period of time, all, so many annulments were given out in the United States especially, that the people were like, you know, come on, you guys, you're not taking this seriously. And a lot of the clergy realized that that was the case. And so the proper response, which some of the bishops uh, did, was to say, you know what, the reason we're giving out all these uh, decrees of nullity is because people are entering into the sacrament having no idea what is going on. They're following the decrees of the world. They're listening to the, you know, all these siren calls. And so they're walking down the aisle thinking that they can get divorced if they feel like it, thinking that they can do whatever they want. And so therefore, they did not enter into that marriage properly informed, they didn't give full free consent, and therefore it's null. So our job as bishops is to make sure that nobody gets married in our church without knowing what the heck's going on. And so they've improved some of the places to try to improve the marriage preparation programs. And I would say one of the best in the country is in Phoenix. Uh, our, uh, Bishop Olmsted has one of the best marriage preparation programs in the country, and I don't think anybody's going to get married in Phoenix and not know what's going on. You know, <laughs> and, 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 and that's the point. And you know, going back to what I said in my in my main remarks the other day ago, um, why 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 do we care so much about this? Well, of course, we want to do what Jesus wants, but we're not just trying to make it easy for people to go through the annulment process. We want to save people the pain of the divorce. You know, we don't want people entering into marriages that are unsuitable for them, or to en enter into it with the wrong frame of mind, and and therefore do stupid things to each other that undermine the marriage. We, you know, we don't want that. We want to spare people. All of that stuff, and that's why that's why the church tries to have better marriage preparation. That's what Jesus wanted for us, you know. And I s sometimes tell people when Jesus was back there telling those apostles back there in Matthew 19, and when he said to them, you know, it's adultery if you remarry. He saw all of these studies that we have now that show that step families are the most difficult families. You know that that re it's not just divorce; it's the remarriage that is so hard on the kids. We have data to prove that Jesus knew what he was talking about. Imagine that. Right? That Jesus saw. Jesus saw that little girl. I just want you to picture this: a little girl who's a flower girl at her mother's second wedding. Okay. And everything's so wonderful, and she's so cute, and it's so lovely. But in her little heart, 
her heart is breaking because she knows her mother and father will never get back together. And there's no space in that family for her to say that out loud, right? Jesus saw her. See, he knew. He knew what that was going to be like. So anyway, I'm back. I'm off on my social science tangent. But, <laughs> but, but I personally really believe that experience is showing the wisdom of what the church has to say about this. So I want to say just a word. I have a couple minutes left. I want to say just a word about Catholic marriage preparation because you guys talked about that a little bit. And I think it helps show um, you know, how Catholics think about this matter. I have a friend who, a couple, a married couple who have been preparing people for marriage in Houston, in the Archdiocese of Houston Galveston, for like 30 years. And what they've come up with is the four F's. Um, marriage should be free. You must be giving your free, con free consent, which means your mom and dad are pushing you into it. Uh, no literal arranged marriage. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, and, and you need to know what you're talking about, right? So people who are not informed properly, that's not really free. Um, it needs to be full. That is, you give yourself completely, you give yourself fully to the other person. You're not holding back. You're not saying, I'm married to you on Tuesday, but not on Wednesday. Or I'm married to you, I give everything except for this. I hold back my money. Or, you know, whatever it is, full. So it has to be free, freely given, has to be full, has to be faithful. Has to be faithful, one to a customer. Right? It has to be faithful, and, um, and not just sexually faithful, but faithful in every way, that you don't speak ill of your spouse. You, know, you can possibly help it. You don't embarrass them. You, know, you, you, are, you are loyal to them. And then finally, fruitful. And this is the one that gives people trouble in the modern age, that marriage should be fruitful. Um, and that, and that, they, that the marital act, um, you know, we mean it literally, in the sense that the marital act should be um, open to new life, uh, there's a kind of myth that Catholics are required to have as many babies as possible. This is not true. Um, you're re you all, all you're required to do is that every sexual act be open to life. You're not required to be having sex at every moment. You know, I mean, really. Are you kidding me? No, you're not, that's not a requirement. So you're allowed to abstain if you want to. If you want to postpone a pregnancy or space your pregnancies, you're allowed to do that. Because, the, because you know, like we're all sitting here abstaining, you know. You're not required to have as many babies as possible. But the act itself needs to be open to life. But that brings up the other sense of fruitful, um, which is that there are many, many fruits of a good marriage. Right? And it's not just literal progeny, but there are many ways in which people build up the community and build up other people and, and so on and so forth. So that even if you are not physically fruitful in your marriage, that you can view your married life together as having the potential to be giving and, uh, and fruitful and, and open for uh, and, and open to others. And then finally, I'll just say, um, just just mention one uh, very big and rather new concept um, that we have, which is given to us by Pope Saint John Paul II, which is the whole concept of the theology of the body. And I don't want to talk about. I don't want to get. Don't get me started on theology of the body. If you want to in questions, I'll, I'll go on forever, um, which I'll be happy to go on forever. But Pope John Paul. Pope St. John Paul II realized that, uh, that we, we needed to do something, that the church needed to say more about uh, human sexuality and marriage than simply saying, no, this is what we're against. No, no, no. You know, when I grew up, we always knew what the church's answer to every question was, no. We didn't know what the question was, but the answer was always no. You know? So Pope John Paul saw that we needed to be talking about positively what we were for. And so this whole work of the theology of the body is an affirmation of the body uh, and an affirmation of the human person as an embodied being and a gendered being and really a defense and explanation of that based on scripture and personalist philosophy. And the bottom line of all of that reflection is that the human person is meant for love. And I'll bet you all of our religions teach that point, that the human person is meant for love, and the proper posture of one person towards another is love, and never use. We must never be using one another. And when using another person comes into our relationships, there's something wrong, and we need to correct that. Okay. And so love can take many forms that are proper to a particular kind of relationship. Um, you know, the love that I have for my colleagues on the panel obviously is different from other kinds of love, but it's always informed by the concept that the other person is a good and an end in themselves and not an object for use. So every person is meant for love, and to just affirm something the rabbi said, every human being is a gift from God, an irreplaceable, 
unrepeatable gift from God. Every single person is a gift from God, and that too informs everything that we do. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so I can have this one minute left signing. Oh, closing. okay. Very so very remember, uh, oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you have questions, Wednesday is at the back to take uh, the cards. So at the very end, we'll have time for that. Thank you so much. Actually, I come from a uh, divorced parents, and you talk about that pain. Uh, it was like that the whole thing fell apart. And even though they remarried, but for my sister and I, it was the end of the world. I remember it was devastating. So. And Jesus knew. Yeah. He didn't want that. Well, I promise I would not say anything, so <laughs> enjoy the speakers. But I was touched. Also, I'm from Argentina. Most of us are Catholic, so I related very much to your presentation. Our next speaker is Dr. Sumeya Ben Haldun. Dr. Haldun is an engineer in information systems and served 14 years as a parliamentarian in Morocco. She was also the former Minister of Higher Education. Dr. Haldun presently is a member of the General Secretariat of the current leading Moroccan party. She's also the founding member of the Azagre Forum for Moroccan Women. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Azahar. Azahar. Sorry. Okay. Representing 190 organizations. She wrote a book on family mediation called The Family Approach to Protecting Family. Dr. Haldun is also an activist for women and family rights. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Smith and But uh, I don't uh, speak English. I am sorry, I don't uh, speak English uh, very well. So I will uh, speak in Arabic, and uh, my friend Kautar will talk. Uh, sorry. Let me hear Arabic. Arabic. Promises. I promise. I promise you that uh, in the next meeting of the Family Congress, I will speak in English. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We were invited to attend the conference due to our nice and very good partnership with Family Watch International through Annie and Sharon Snyder. And she wasn't expected, expecting to give a talk in such a session. حضرت فقط لأنني أؤمن بأن الأسرة مشترك إنساني ومشترك بين مختلف الديانات علينا أن نعمل جميعا من أجل الحفاظ عليها. But Ms. Ramaya came because she is someone who is convinced that the family is something that is common in between all faiths and that's something we should protect and preserve like all around the world. وحضرت كذلك انطلاقا من قناعتي في ديانة الإسلام. والتي يقول الله سبحانه وتعالى إن خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا أعتقد أنه صعب. That's okay. But she she also came because of her religious conviction that when God says just the meaning that I created you from both male and female and made you into different communities so that you get to know about each other. So that's a verse. That's verse one, chapter four. طبعا الوقت المخصص للمداخلة لا يكفي للتحدث مطولا عن منظومة الأسرة في الإسلام لذلك سأحاول فقط أن أعطي بعض الإشارات حول هذا الموضوع. Because the time does not allow to talk about like all the details about family in Islam, Ms. Sumay is going to be using her time to shed light on different aspects of the Islamic perspective on family and marriage. سأتحدث أولا عن أساس العلاقات الأسرية في الإسلام. First is about the basis of family formation in Islam. 
Then the functions of the family in Islam also. What's a kabul al wadaif? Complementarity of roles between husbands and wives. ثم تماسك الأسرة. And then how we in Islam try to keep families uh, the family cohesion. هذه الأهم. إذن بالنسبة لأساس العلاقات الأسرية. فأولا رسول الإسلام محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم رغب في الزواج حيث قال أن إذا تزوج العبد فقد استكمل نصف الدين فليتقي الله في النصف الآخر. Yeah, so the importance of family was stressed out in a lot of verses of the Quran but also in many of the hadiths and that's the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. And in one of the hadiths he actually said and that arises in several instances when a man marries, he has fulfilled the half of his religion. So let him fear God and follow him regarding the remaining half. So he made religion half of uh, marriage as half of the religion. Well, the second thing is that in terms of the importance of marriage and the importance of the family, Allah Ta'ala made it from the Ayatihi. Can you explain that? And from the Ayatihi, He made it from your own self and your own self to your own self and to your own self and to your own self. So this sacred bond between a man and a woman is one that is blessed by God. It's a bond of love and compassion. It's one that is considered to be one of God's signs in the world. Like if you look around the world, you can see signs getting you to God. Marriage and the bond, marriage, marriage bond is one of them. So God Almighty said in chapter 30, verse 21, and among his signs is that he created for you mates from among yourselves that you may dwell with them in serenity and tranquility. And he has put love and compassion between your hearts. Truly in that are signs for those who reflect. In these three things for the marriage in Islam, that he is the half of the faith, that he is the one from the Lord, and that he is the one who is on the peace and the peace and the peace. So this is how, like, somehow how marriage is defined. It is a basis of the whole religion, being half of it, it is one of God's signs in the world, how to recognize God, and it is based on serenity, love, and compassion. Mm -hmm. And then we go to the second point, which is about the functions of family. وانطلاقا من هذا التوازن النفسي يستطيع المرء ان 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 ينطلق في العمل في الحياه في البناء. Okay, I'm just gonna build a bit to get to this, this idea. So actually families are built uh, are based on a union between a man and a woman as the natural and the only way of preserving the human race. This this is the first so like preserving the التوازن النفسي على الحفاظ الثاني. So uh, Okay, we get we'll get to this later on. So she was saying one of the family's functions regards preserving the psychological welfare of the individuals, and that's what the Quran refers to as being a garment for each other. God says uh, that in chapter two, they, meaning your wives, O man, are a garment for you, and you, man, are a garment for them. That's how close a marital relationship can get. That's how deep it can get. So that man can be just like the clothing that preserves, that covers, that protects his wife. And the wife also plays the same role, whether it's psychologically speaking, socially speaking, or even in like different other aspects. Yeah. And then the second function would be, as I was saying, to preserve the human race, be it the only way to do it. God says in the book also, and Allah has made for you mates and companions of your own nature, and made for you out of them sons and daughters and grandchildren, and provided for you sustenance of the best. Will they then believe in vain things and be ungrateful for Allah's favors? ثم الوظيفة الثالثة للأسرة هي ما يتعلق بتربية النشء وتوريد العقائد وبناء الأفكار. And the, the third function would be one of educating children and, uh, um, let's say, preserving the faith and building the values. Mm -hmm. 
مريم التي بدورها ولدت عيسى عليه السلام فهناك صورة كاملة تتحدث عن مسألة التربية وهي صورة آل عمران yeah. Actually there is a whole chapter in the Quran called Al Imran meaning the family of Imran Family of Imran for us is the fact is uh, Maryam's, these are Maryam's parents and Mary, yes. so we say Maryam alayhi salam. So they did, they educated Maryam so that we have what we now know as Mary alayhi salam who gave birth to al Messiah, who is for us the prophet, who is Jesus Christ, and who is uh, one uh, very beloved prophet for us Muslims. So the whole chapter goes on how Maryam was raised because her mother actually wanted the, as we believe, she wanted a son that she could give to the uh, temple, who could live in the temple. But even when she got a daughter, she was, she said, just saying the meaning, oh God, I wanted a son, but I got a daughter, and you are all knowing, you're the Almighty, so I'm still gonna give my daughter to the temple. I still want her to be a servant. And in Arabic, Maryam actually see, means the ser servant of God. وكفى لها زكريا ثم لدينا صورة أخرى هي صورة لقمان والتي تتحدث عن تربية لقمان لابنه وإذ قال لقمان لابنه وهو يعظه يا بني لا تشرك بالله إن الشرك لظلم عظيم وكل هذه الصورة صورة لقمان تبين لنا أسس التربية للأبناء Yeah, there is another chapter that is a, a lot more shorter, but it's called Luqman. And that's one of the prophets also who has been talking all through the chapter to his son, giving him all the commandments of such and from believing in God, the Almighty, through uh, respecting and honoring his fa parents to tell the way he has to talk and he has to treat other people in modesty and in humble way. كذلك العديد من الآيات في القرآن الكريم تتحدث عن تربية موسى عليه السلام وكيف ألقته أمه في اليم ثم بعد ذلك التقطه فرعون وكيف كانت تربيته وكيف أصبح نبيا بعد ذلك. Different chapters and verses also refer to the raise, the reason of Moses, how he was raised, how he was uh, well, given away by his mother due to the circumstances and how he was raised by Pharaoh, but Came, became Moses that we all know the 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 beloved prophet. إذن بصفة عامة إذا قلت التوازن النفسي ثم الحفاظ على وجود البشري تربية النشأ والوظيفة الرابعة هي تتعلق برعاية المسنين بحيث الأسرة في الإسلام لا تنحصر وظائفها على الأبناء بل تمتد للآباء والأجداد يقول الله تعالى وبالوالدين إحسانا وذي القربة yeah. The family has another function, or among its other functions also, would be taking care of the elderly. And that's where the tradition of the extended family stems from. A family is not, a, is not only the unit of parents plus children, but it's also children, grandchildren, fa parents, and grandparents. So that's the whole system. Mm. أنتقل إلى النقطة الثالثة والمتعلقة بالأدوار وتكامل الأدوار بين كل مكونات الأسرة داخل الأسرة. Yeah, now referring to how complementary roles between husbands and wives can be or have to be. لأن في المنظومة الإسلامية الأسرية نؤمن بتكامل الأدوار وليس بتضادها. Yeah. We, we believe that roles between husbands and wives are complementary and they're not contradictory, like they complement each other. Like كمثال مثلا على ذلك في مرحلة الرضاعة يقول الله سبحانه وتعالى والوالدات يرضعن أولادهن حولين كاملين لمن أراد أن يتم الرضاعة وعلى المولود له كسوتهن وعلى المولود له رزقهن وكسوتهن بالمعروف إذا قلت إذا لأن بصفة عامة أن يعني في الإسلام الزوجة ليست ملزمة بالعمل خارج البيت لأن إذا إذا أرادت أن تحضن أطفالها فالزوج هو الملزم على أن ينف أن يكون هو الذي ينفق عليها والزوجة يمكنها أن يعني تهتم بالنشأ وإذا أرادت طبعا العمل خارج البيت فهو مسموح لها. So as Muslims we value both motherhood and fatherhood like both and each of the two two roles. 
And one of the examples Ms. Sumeya cited was, is the one during the period of nursing when the mother is breastfeeding. She is allowed to choose whether she wants to go out and work or just to uh, be uh, like um, to spend all her time with her children. And one of the verses shows how, how the roles at that point get complementary. God says in verse uh, 233, chapter 2, mothers may breastfeed their children two complete years for whoever wishes to complete the nursing period. Upon the father is the mother's provision and their clothing to what is acceptable. No person is charged with more than his capacity. No mother should be harmed through her child and no father through his child. So it just shows how if she decides, if she's the one doing the breastfeeding, if she's the one staying home with the child, the father has to but earn money at this point, <laughs> but has to provide for her and her children in a way that is complementary. Oh, it's okay, you have a few more because of the translation. I, think we I, am sure, I am the next, uh, I am the next, uh, the last speaker. No, we still have another. So, so uh, we are tired. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> فالرسول عليه الصلاة والسلام يقول خيركم خيركم لأهله وأنا خيركم لأهلي بمعنى ضرورة أن الخيرية تكون حسب التعامل مع الأهل وبالتالي النظام العام هو نظام الاحترام التام المتبادل So this, this complementarity happens in the context of uh, mutual respect and mutual love and mutual compassion to a point where uh, people should be judged, like people's faith can even be judged by their relationship to their spouses. And the Prophet says, the believers who show the most perfect faith are those who have the best behavior, and the best of you are those who are the best to their wives. So, I mean, your relationship to your spouse, to your wife, to your children, to your husband, would reflect directly whether you have a good or bad behavior, whether you are a faithful person or not so faithful. إذن النقطة الأخيرة تتعلق بتماسك الأسرة وكيف أن الإسلام وضع عدة قضاء وضع عدة أسس من أجل الحفاظ على تماسك الأسرة. So given its importance, this sacred unit of marriage of family has to be protected and preserved. And Mr. May is going to shed light on a couple concepts in that. في هذا الإطار مثلاً لد يعني كمثال على ذلك. هناك صورة كاملة في القرآن اسمها صورة المجادلة وحيث تتحدث هذه الصورة عن سيدة سمع الله سبحانه وتعالى شكواها قد سمع الله قول التي تجادلك في زوجها وتشتكي إلى الله والله يسمع تحاوركما إن الله سميع عليم فيعني في هذا الإطار سمع الله هذه الشكوى من هذه السيدة التي كانت تشتكي من سوء تعامل زوجها وحتى هذا الزوج على حسن التعامل ومن خلاله جميع الأزواج على حسن التعامل ولا سيما فيما يتعلق بالعلاقات الحميمية بين المرأة والرجل. So yeah, we, we, would we would love to believe that uh, given the heavenly reward that is for caring and loving for our spouses, every family would live in harmony and love and compassion. Unfortunately, problems would arise or could arise. So there is a chapter also in the Quran called The Pleading Woman. That's, I guess, chapter 58, where a woman came to the Prophet uh, complaining about her husband, one who would abuse her, one with whom she didn't have very good relationship. So the verse is, shows how, how caring God is uh, of this woman. And he said, Allah, it's the first verse of the chapter, said, Allah has indeed heard and accepted the statement of the woman who pleads with thee concerning her husband, and carries her complaint in prayer to Allah. And Allah always hears the arguments between both sides among you, for Allah hears and sees all things. And ongoing the other verses of the, the chapter, God is, given, is urging this husband, but also through him, all different husbands, to treat their uh, wives very well and, not, and to not abuse them, whether it's physically or emotionally.
وكذلك سورة أخرى تتحدث أنه في حال الشقاق لا بد من السعي إلى الصلح يقول الله سبحانه وتعالى وإن خفتم شقاق بينهما فابعثوا حكما من أهله وحكما من أهلها إن يريد إصلاحا يوفق الله بينهما Yeah, so, so problems do arise and some trivial problems can get bigger and that's when the pro-family approach <laughs> steps in. That's when the extended family can be called in. The, the, in Islam we have what we call like arbitra arbitration and that's family arbitration and it's institutionalized in the text. God says, verse 35, chapter 4, and in, if you fear dissension between the two, send an arbitrator from his people and an arbitrator from, from her people. If they both desire reconciliation, Allah will cause it between them. Allah is ever known and acquainted with all things. ففي هذه الحالة يمكن اللجوء إلى الطلاق ولكنه أبغض الحالة لعند الله والمنظومة الإسلامية أحاطت الطلاق بمجموعة من المبادئ من أجل الحفاظ على حقوق الأبناء وعلى حقوق الزوجة المطلقة كذلك ولنا في القرآن سورة صغيرة تسمى سورة الطلاق تتحدث عن هذه المبادئ okay. So just to conclude, if all of these measures and others didn't uh, uh, or don't, don't succeed Islam leaves the window open for divorce under very strict conditions in order to prevent or to, or to protect the rights for the children and both the, the husband and the wife or the, the divorcees. So it is, it is not something that uh, we would go to directly. You have to go through, as I said, a lot of uh, like arbitration through the extended family, maybe even bringing other people into the, the process to help solve the issues. But if in the case that relationship cannot continue, then and I, I think we can talk about this more during the discussion. بصفة عامة إذن هذه المبادئ والأسس التي تقوم عليها الأسرة في الإسلام وبالأساس وأساسها وعمودها الفقري هو المودة والرحمة والسكين. So this, these are just. Uh, lights shed on few concepts regarding family and marriage in Islam, but the basis of all of this is love, serenity, and compassion between the husband and the wife. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, if we take the translation, uh, she spoke for only nine minutes. So, so a big hand again for Dr. and see the significance of the family in different faith traditions. So that's why we feel it's not a human institution, but somehow it's God's institution, because it's so holy and sacred for all our religions. Our next speaker is Ms. Lynn Wallace. Ms. Wallace teaches sociology at the University of Bridgeport with an emphasis on marriage and family. She serves as director of the Universal Peace Federation's office of marriage and family. Her most recent publications are entitled Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment, published in the Family and the MDGs, Millennium Development Goals, and Intergenerational Solidarity, the Springboard for Society Wellbeing in the Family Futures. Lane also serves as the co-chair of the United Nations NGO Committee on the Family in New York, but her greatest pride is her family. Her husband, Dr. Thomas Walsh, he is the president of the Universal Peace Federation International. That's my higher boss. <laughs> and their two sons and one granddaughter. So please, let's welcome Lynn Walsh. simple overview of, of 
the theology from uh, my church, which is the Unification Church, which started uh, in Korea in 1954 uh, by Reverend Sung Young Moon, who died just three years ago. Um, it was originally called the Holy Spirit Association for World Christianity, a big title. And uh, then it was simplified Unification Church, but more recently it's the Family Federation for World Peace. So that's a hint uh, that the family is, is a key, a pillar throughout our, our whole theology. The creation, the, the fall, and, and restoration. So it's very much centered on marriage and, and family. Um, how do we know God? We know God. Is it showing? Ah. I just turned it on. Oh, thank you. Here it comes. <coughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> how do we know God? We know God by observing nature. If God's the creator, as any artist, um, we, the artist expresses themselves in, in himself in the creation. So. My older son studies physics. He's studying God. My other son studied theology. He's studying God, too. <laughs> um, so as an artist, uh, nature is reflected. Not, she's not plugged in. Can you just yeah. can oh, can you help her? Let me just read Thank you. I'm doing I'm doing it. Thank you. Is it that one? There, oh, let me see if I can get an engineer. While we're do doing this, just remember to write your uh, questions on the cards. And then uh, we have Wendy back there. Maybe you did this and I did the reading. Because it was working before. Yeah, it was working. And it's this one? Washin. That's right. That's right. Washin is mad. And I'll continue on. I hope all this covering. The computer thinks this is all this. Um, so, when we look at creation, um, I have a wonderful picture of proton and neutron, and stamen and pistol, and male and female. And that the two, complementarity of two opposites is is universal, and that's how life exists and life is uh, maintained. Sorry, this is such a distraction. I loved when uh, our Muslim sister was talking to our rabbi about 
how, how much similarity they had. That was very beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, everybody. Thank you. Everybody was trying to help. Questions? One day. Okay. So um, we know God by looking at creation. Um, there's all things have an internal nature, laws, mind, right, uh, spirit, and then the physical form. It exists in everything that is in creation. And just in the same way as I said, also there's complementarity of masculine and feminine, positive and negative, yin and yang of the universe. Um, and we see it in, in much of the scripture, and it's been repeated, God created man and woman in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them, because that is God's nature, male and female. Um, also, God is our parent. Um, parents are masculine and feminine. Uh, and Father, God has, I had experienced, experienced God as a father with you know, there's a right and the wrong, and there's rules and the principles, and if you don't follow, there's consequences, but also compassion, forgiveness, and compassion, and, and, and unconditional love. And I need both, and I know my children need both. And God is most essentially love, and the parental love that will never give up, will keep on giving, and that's really the development of a heart that God wants us to develop, too. Um, Whoever does not love, whoever does not love, does not know God, because God is love. Um, and God, why did God create us? Because He wants objects of love. He loves us. He wants to have relationships with us. God is very relational. That's because that's why we're very relational. We have to have relationships. And um, we reflect our heavenly parent because. Through this desire for uh, relationship and love, and and so that I, so really the purpose of our life is to perfect our love, a love of God, a love of self, and a love of all first in our families, and 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 others to really live for other people because that's God's heart. Um, so the so the family creates this st stability where we grow spiritually. First, as, ch as a child, we learn the parental love, the, uh, the absolute unconditional giving, and yet we, need, we, we learn the, principle, the uh, principles and rules. Then we have to learn how to share, right? Uh, how to negotiate, how to deal with, with conflict, and that's another part of our spiritual growth. But also can uh, conjugal love, which is uh, another whole self-giving and learning of how to love another person that is really quite opposite than us, from my experience. And then parental love, which we understand more than ever the heart of God, because we can't control our kids, right? And certainly knows that God can't control us as much as he'd like to, but why? Because God wants us to choose love, and to do that, he has to give us free will and responsibility. So many times we make the wrong mistakes, just like our kids do. Um, and and the, the importance of uh, filial piety, uh, the rabbi um, I re referred to this. When a man honors his father and mother, God says, I regard, regard this as though I dwelt among them, and they have honored me. So God feels when there is a, a family that is centered on God and filial piety, that God, God lives there. That's where God feels most at home, and we want God to live in our homes. And it's because we are learning to love each other that God can live there. Um, so marriage, I really feel, is, well, every, every one of those levels in, in, in family is a spiritual challenge, a spiritual growth. Oh, and I love that, I, I have to say, we read scripture in the morning, and, and one of them is called World Scripture, and it's some of uh, 
I say Father Moon's writings, but also with scripture from all over the world. And that's actually our favorite uh, book to read from. And I, I chose two ones yes. that you chose too. <laughs> I'll just mention this first one. Your wives are a garment for you, and you are a garment for them. I think that's so beautiful. You're protecting each other. You're, you're caring for each other. It's very tender, but also there's modesty in it. You know, I just think it, it, it reflects so much of what you know, that ideal complementary care is that is God means for a man and a man. So I feel marriage is the highest reflection of God's nature and purpose of creation. Um, uh, I think this has been Oh my goodness. Okay, quick. So, um, <laughs> and that's my quote. That's the quote I used too. So you're quoting it. Okay. 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 This is what I get off on my side. So, but we're not the same. We're, we're different. We have equal value to God, but our brains are different, and that's why it's so difficult to be married. But that's the challenge. We have to love this person that isn't like this at all. They've got a different brain. Okay, I'll go. go. We parent different, differently. We have different gifts because we're different. Yes, pretty funny, right? Um, and our, our children need both the, the, the nurturing, the compassion, but also, okay, Climb higher, right? Um, and as sexually, we're different. I cut this off. This this cheap one was funny. The the ladies are eating and the guys are smelling. <laughs> we're sexually different, and that's important too. I need another brother here. Balance. Um, and, and then and then of course fundamentally we're reproductively different, um, and that. You know, predicts and, and, and has a lot to do with what, what kind of roles we have in parenting and and what we give to our, our children. Um, and then um, this this quote um, about the two shall become one flesh, so that they are no longer two but one flesh. For God has joined together, let no man separate. We all have a heart and a brain and a lungs, right? But how many of us say we have a reproductive system? We don't. My husband and I do, though. Right? I mean, I think that's what, that's, it, one flesh is really one flesh. And nothing else can create life. And the lineage, I, I see lineage reflected in all of our, in our religions. And it's, it creates the conjugal relationship of sex is spiritual, emotional, physical, it creates life, it creates love, it creates lineage, and it, it, it centers uh, society. Um, Reverend Moon said, as a man and woman, each being half of the whole, we would come together to form one body. As God's partners, we would, be, we would perfect the ideal of divine love. I got to move quickly. I did have something about theology of the body. So, um, the perfection of <clears throat> a love of a man and woman is the perfection of the universe. I like that. But the day this love is shattered, the order of the universe will be destroyed and the entire vertical world will collapse. This is about all that love. So we believe that the fall was, <clears throat> again, God gave Adam and Eve the responsibility and choice, <clears throat> but they were immature. And we believe that the fall was was sexual. So because of that, um, all the stories in the Bible have been lots of familial struggles, right, and conflict. And we see that that is being attacked most today, sexual purity, the, man, the relationship between a man and wife, a man and wife. Um, so the providence of, of God's bringing us back is through restoring is original ideal through marriage, through God-centered marriage. And that's why we have these strange mass weddings, because we ask young people to come together, dedicate themselves to, to God, to each other, but also to humankind, because marriage is for the sake of humankind, too. And uh, this was a large, small wedding, right, in Manila. 
and then uh, we had one at the UN. We didn't make any friends that for that one. But, uh, but uh, this is the pledge we take, and it's the ideal. We've been talking about divorce. We're not perfect yet. We've got a lot of Trump uh, challenges in the reality of marriage, but the pledge is to be faithful sexually, to raise children in pre preparation for marriage, and to oops, and um, that to 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 combine to build bridges between all races, religions, because we are one. Family. Okay, we only have a few minutes of questions. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, we only have five minutes left. And I think uh, I have here a couple of questions, but uh, I would rather give a, a last minute for a final thought. You want to close? Uh, otherwise, we don't, we're not going to make it in five minutes. And then, you just want each one of us to say a few words? Is, yeah. that, is that what you're asking? Do you want and then, you know, we have, after the session is over, you can oh. ask each one uh, your individual question. Because I'm getting here a sign saying that we have to really close. We're good. Is that okay? Okay. Yes. Some it's a suggestion. Oh, it's a suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is not fair. It's not bad, huh? <laughs> 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 Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 I was just thinking, today's theme has been, you know, go and do, what's next, what can we do about the things we've been talking about for the last few days. So my encouragement would be simply find an opportunity to reach out to people of other faiths in your community, or more broadly, and find ways to make some of those connections between faith, because we have so many wonderful things to do together, and I think there's a lot of strength in that. So just an idea for, for action as you go back home, find people of other faith and, and find ways to work together. And building strong families. So um, I enjoyed learning about other people's beliefs. That was a, a very enjoyable, and I learned some things that I did not know. So that was that was great. But I'm I'm interested in the in the way that all of our different faiths, um, in some way, our view of marriage is, does reflect our view of the cosmos. You know, and that that is a common theme throughout. And so the difference in the belief about the cosmos and the different belief about marriage are kind of mirror images of each other. So I would just like to point out that the modern secular world, I think it's true for them as well. And, and here's what I think is, is true for a lot of them. There are a lot of people who really believe that the universe was uh, created randomly um, for no particular reason at all, uh, by no particular person at all, and that er everything is kind of random atoms bumping into each other. If you, if, not to be flippant, but that is kind of a metaphor for the hookup culture, where there's no particular purpose to your sexual encounter, there's no necessary consequence from it, and it doesn't have any intrinsic meaning. And all of our different uh, groups um, have something to say that it does have meaning, and we might differ about what that meaning is, but we all think it means something, And whereas the modern world is saying there isn't really any meaning except what you happen to assign to it. So I think that the religious view is intrinsically more appealing than that, that nothingness. So if I can just add on to this, so she, is she saying so all of us have that sense that it's part of something bigger and not just about this life, but something divine and something eternal in some sense? I think that's significant. Yeah, I love your, I love your comment. Um, I mean, I, I do marriage education, and the, the worst enemy of marriage is selfishness. And if we're centered on ourselves, not something higher, you can't get out of your selfishness. So um, it's so important we have an understanding of, of God or higher purpose in a relationship. So um, uh, we really have to understand the higher purpose and it's God's purpose so that we can grow. I really think our purpose is to grow spiritually in love. And we cannot do it without commitment where we have to rub against each other and look at our selfishness, and that's what God loves. 
One more minute. <laughs> اليوم العالم يشكو من التفكك الاسري وما ادى اليه من جرائم تتعلق بتناول المخدرات بالاشكالات المتعلقه بالعلاقات خارج الزواج بالانتحار بالاحباط بالعنف العديد من المشاكل يمكن ان نتساعد بعضنا من اجل فكها من خلال الحفاظ على مؤسسه الاسره. Yeah. The problems we have to work together to try to solve are the world's problem. Now the world is suffering from family breakdowns, from uh, drug abuse, from frustration, uh, suicide, violence. These are the problems we have to join hands in order to fight. اليوم الاسره تتعرض الى هجمه كبيره على صعيد على اصعده متعدده. Family is under attack from different aspects. واليوم علينا كما قلت ان نتظافر ولا سيما على مستوى العمل من خلال العمل من الامم المتحده من اجل وضع قوانين تحمي الاسره. That's why we have to join hands and work through the system from within the UN system, from within the policies, laws and policies we can make to protect our families. فقط اود ان اختم بمثال بسيط بالنسبه لبلدي المغرب. Just an example from Morocco to end. اشتغلنا في 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 منظمتنا منتدى الزهراء للمرأة المغربية. In our organization for Mas Zahra, we have worked. اشتغلنا كثيرا من أجل الأسرة وحاولنا أن نؤثر على القوانين وعلى الدستور المغربي. So we had we tried to have the biggest influence and to influence to change the laws in the Moroccan constitution in a way to protect the family. ونحن جد سعيدات اليوم أنه في سنة 2011. خلال مراجعة الدستور استطعنا أن نضيف مادة إلى الدستور هي موجودة في الدستور الحالي تتعلق بالمادة 32 من الدستور. So we are glad and blessed to say that we were successful in since starting 2011 the constitution was revised and now there is an article 32 paragraph 32 stating that Morocco has to protect the family be it the fundamental unit of the society one that is based on a lawful marriage between one man and woman.